Pat Hume is looking at old photos from the march. All men, she says, or nearly, that's how it was. Her husband marched that day. She was at home, eight months pregnant and with the couple's three small children. Pat's memory of the morning of what became Bloody Sunday in 1972 is, oh my God, I think I'm pregnant again. <laughs> there were women on Duke Street that October day in 1968, great women. But mostly in those early days, the women of Derry were not marching, but minding. Struggling nonetheless. No one could have gone out if they had not stayed at home. The chant might have been one man, one vote, but it was women who bore the brunt of rearing families in the gerrymandered slums. John Hume used to say, I'm the parcel, but Pat delivers me. It's an oddly charming statement, but there's something enigmatic about it. Maybe because Pat's role as the wife of that visionary leader is really quite complicated, as John was well aware. What everyone who knows them acknowledges is that Pat was every bit as involved in the transformation of Northern Ireland as her husband. He could not have done a thing without her. She's an unsung hero who doesn't want to be sung. She does her best to dissuade me from writing about her. I'm boring as hell, she says. Write about the women who were out there campaigning. Write about Maureen O'Doherty, Kitty O'Kane, Sheila McLean, Cathy Harkin. Yes, yes, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, but to get back to Pat. Mary Robinson said the great civil rights campaigner Inez McCormack taught her that sometimes you can be more effective if you don't feel the need to take the credit. Mary Beard says that if women are to be included in history, we need to look at leadership as being about more than just the single charismatic figure. We need to think collaboratively and about power as the ability to be effective, to make a difference to the world. Early evidence of Pat's power of influence. John was training to be a priest when he met her. <laughs> she was known back then as Babs, Babs Hone. Pat ran the Hume household. She was also the breadwinner, a teacher, a surprisingly stern teacher, I'm told. Some were misled by her beauty and her ready smile into thinking she'd be a walkover. She had shimmering blue eyes and a swathe of wheat-coloured hair which she wore in a plait. She was 21 when she taught her first class. There were 56 teenagers in it. The Humes relied on another woman too. This was Molly Doherty, known as Nana. She looked after the children. Reliable, practical and full of laughter, Molly kept the family afloat for 23 years. Pat says that when she got in from school, Molly would be out the door like a shooting star. <laughs> she doesn't blame her. Our house wasn't the easiest, she says. It wasn't just the five mad feckers, as the Hume children were described to me by one of them, Mo. There were also what Pat calls the unpredictabilities. The house never emptied, she says. A constant stream of people called on the phone or to the door, seeking help with problems, which included, according to Mo, housing, brew not coming through, sun lifted by the British Army, someone had the shit kicked out of them, passport required. It was Pat who spent her evenings dealing with all of this, who attended funerals and knew everybody. After John became an MEP in 1979, she formally took over running his constituency office. John was often away, setting up credit unions, attending parliaments, meeting world leaders. He was Washington, Dublin, Brussels, London, Belfast. Pat was Derry. She was the Hume's Derryness. But John took no significant decisions ever without consulting his wife. His trust in her political judgment was complete. There were always visitors. John was hospitable. Pat was the host. He could make Irish stew under supervision. <laughs> Once John invited a bishop and his wife to lunch, Pat, who was about to give birth, served boiled eggs. <laughs> Every so often, she admits, I would erupt. They lived under siege for decades. Every day brought hate mail, threats and abusive phone calls from unionists, from republicans. IRA supporters stoned the house and petrol bombed it. Pat did her best to shield the children. Mo recalls her mother swearing, 
just once and with just one word, when she opened the door one night to find her car and the windows of the house in flames. When the Hume Adams talks were revealed, John was being denounced by the British and Irish establishments while acts of mass murder were proliferating in the North. It was hell, Pat says. I don't know how we survived. John, in truth, did not survive well. His health is broken. He has dementia and now another brutal illness that is stripping him of his faculties. Pat has become the memory John has lost. For years she has been his guide, by his side to mediate encounters with strangers and friends, always gracious, always knowing what to say. If John says the wrong thing, people let it pass now. Pat says Derry has become a city of kindness. Pat has had cancer and other afflictions, but she says she's reached her four score years and she looks back with gratitude. She has great friends, children she's proud of, grandchildren to snuggle up with on the sofa, and, as of this summer, a first great-grandchild. She walks the banks of the foil. She loves Lisa McGee's Derry Girls and can recite and discuss in detail entire episodes. <laughs> Remember the cream horn on Pump Street? She loves to quote Seamus Heaney. There is one among us who never swerved from all his instincts told him was right action, who stood his ground in the indicative. She's thinking about John. I'm thinking about Pat too. Her modesty is part of what her daughter Mo calls her phenomenal grace. Thank you.